formulation. Well, good afternoon. Not nearly as full as what we were before, but hopefully we can keep your attention. Um, I want to thank the organizing committee, having been in this position before, of uh, trying to get all the speakers to talk about the same thing and have a theme. It's uh, reassuring when they do actually come together. And you've heard a number of themes here already this afternoon. Uh, and what I want to try to do is to demystify this concept of the word dynamic. So you've heard about static databases or static tables. I want to talk about what we mean by dynamic tables. Um, and so I am a professor at the University of Illinois. That's my day job. Um, but other things that I do in addition to that, uh, we do a lot of data science, and big data is a, a part of this. And in particular, um, being trained in Lai Adeola's lab, having that uh, desire to go after more things, I work a lot with the National Animal Nutrition Program. And I'll be speaking today of, of some of the resources that we've developed there as part of that. So you're going to see a lot of branding um, from NANP. That's because I'm in charge of the branding with NANP and in charge of the website. So those are the things I love doing on the side. That's how I relax, right? Um, but what we're going to talk about is this concept of uh, compositional data. So thinking about the feedstuffs that we're using in poultry nutrition, uh, managing our flocks, and actually getting at accurate and precise numbers as part of that. So this is what we've been discussing already, right? If we want to have precision nutrition, this theory of being as accurate as possible and getting the nutrients to the bird, no extra wastage, no deficiencies as part of that, uh, as other speakers have discussed, we need to know what's in the diet, and therefore, in the, the composition of those ingredients, and also how well the animal is going to use those. So it's about the total nutrients and then some of the inefficiencies by which the messy biology is not able to use those. And coming together, we want to, again, minimize that excretion. So really having these accurate nutrient composition data is part of a, uh, the precision diet formulation. Now, I'm going to throw some acronyms at you. Um, academically, I grew up calling them the, the NRC reports, right? And nowadays, it's not, the, not just the National Research Council, but the national academies that these reports are part of. And I have the good fortune of serving on the currently convened poultry committee that's writing a, the report right now. And just as a little bit of background, this is where we as nutritionists typically go if we want to know what is the composition of the feedstuff that we're using. These reports being quite thick, many of those pages had to do with these tables that had the composition of individual ingredients in them. It's been a critical source for what we do. And we've heard today that there's other sources out there as well, databases maintained either by uh, larger groups um, in a public forum or by individual companies. Um, but largely, each of those committees dictates the rules by which they want to gather data to go into that report when it comes to feed composition. Uh, and by that, I mean they, they maybe choose the literature or not the literature. And I'll give some examples of both of those. But those committees determine how they source the data, how they consolidate it, and it really does differ by species. And maybe you've only ever picked up the poultry NRC, but if you look at beef and dairy, for example, they didn't use any literature values. They only used commercial lab data. But in the end, all of the NRC or NASM reports have tables that are printed. That's what I mean by static. Those numbers are not going to change after they are printed. So they are dependent on how that committee chose those ingredients at what time frame, based on that source of information, they cannot change after the fact. So those composition tables provide that static information. And it's a primary goal of the National Animal Nutrition Program, or NANP, to be able to take that information from those individual committees per species, consolidate all of the data together, put it in an online format, make, a, make it publicly available, and give the user the ability to change those output tables. That's where the dynamic nature is going to come in. And I'll go through that and make, be very visual about that. Now, respecting what poultry science says about not taking pictures of slides, I don't care if you take pictures of my slides. In fact, you're all on your phones already. I'm going to assume for the next 20 minutes that you are on the National Animal Nutrition Program's website and are testing out the resources that I'm going to be talking about. But I'm going to give you some visuals that will be uh, highlighting some of the different features of what it is here today. So just trying to bring this information to, to what we've been building for the last uh, 12 years. But who is NANP? NANP is a USDA NEFA funded uh, program that's called the National Research Support Project, or NRSP. And we're number nine as part of this. So we are publicly funded through the USDA as part of this. And as you can imagine, then we're giving back, we are using taxpayer dollars, but we are giving back to the research community. And in particular, we provide research-based data on feed ingredients, uh, feeding strategies, and animal performance. And I'll talk about how these all fit together. Um, but providing resources 
for use in, in precision formulation of diets. We've got 45 uh, scientists and advisors. There are quite a few in the audience today, and I'm sharing this stage with a number of NANP members. So it's folks who are in industry, who are in academic positions as well, um, that we are across the different ag species. So again, it's, it's species agnostic. We're trying to understand in this case, uh, we're organized both with a, a coordinating committee, but also with uh, two subcommittees. So I chair the feed composition committee as part of that. Uh, we also have a modeling committee. But these two committees together are handling the same exact issues that other speakers today have been talking about. It's about the inputs and the outputs. How do we take the data, collect the data, and use that data for bigger things? So again, you can go to NANP uh, website at animalnutrition.org uh, to see what these resources are. These are all freely available. You do have to register to get access to them. Um, but I'm going to take the, the rest of the time here to kind of walk through what is it, how do we use it, and how can this be used to improve what we're doing uh, in precision management. So just a quick history, um, and we had a little bit of this uh, previously. Dr. Applegate had talked a little bit about this, uh, where we are with NRC reports. And so here is just going over some, some of the history as, as how this has come about. And I've organized this by the four main species, swine, poultry, beef, and dairy, uh, with the dates that are on there uh, for poultry putting TBD on this. But just highlighting the different ways these different committees have chosen to select the data that goes into their feed composition summary tables that are pr in those printed reports. So in swine uh, 2012, there were 112 ingredients. Uh, we have closer to 124 uh, in the current poultry. Notice how many records went into each of those, but swine and poultry together, those two committees independently have decided they wanted to use only literature-based data. So they go on, only go to peer-reviewed literature. They have stylized rules for how they're going to select those particular uh, data sets. So basically saying these are the journals, these are the years. And so now between swine and poultry, we are between 1995 and 2018, covering a span uh, of that many years. I say, how have we, how have we summarized them? manual or moderated. This means that it took a human, in this case, lots of graduate students, a long time to go through every one of those journals during that time period to select any peer-reviewed publication that met our criteria as having the type of uh, quality data that we wanted to use. But in the end, it's still a human applying those rules to uh, obtain that. Records here, we're only talking about uh, 4,000 to 5,000 total records. And by that, I mean individual rows or uh, individual ingredients that were analyzed that go into that database. Now, beef and dairy in 2016 and 2021, respectively, took a very different approach. They said, we don't want to go through the, the literature. We know that there are also issues there. Uh, sometimes graduate students make mistakes in analyzing things. So it's not foolproof, and we want to take a more robust approach. So they partnered with commercial labs and only used commercial lab data. Notice the number of records in each of those. So the number of ingredients has gone up, we're now talking ruminant species, but the number of records has gone up to, into the millions. Right, so this requires a partnership with individual commercial labs, and we are certainly through NANP looking for perennial data curation. We want to always have new data coming in as part of this. But we can then be objective in the ways that we, we curate that data coming from commercial laboratories. And I'm going to talk about how we have some problems with it, but we can go through an outlier removal identify objectively how uh, one record may not be uh, completely accurate. And in addition to that, dairy's gone one step further. In, in addition to doing an outlier analysis, they've also done a PCR cluster analysis, which instead of us naming the ingredient, the data named the ingredient, put them into kind of subcategories. And when it comes to ruminant species, we're talking about different maturities of forages that would be going in. So finding subsets of information that we didn't even know existed out there. But even with all this information, every report to date has put out in some way a static summary table that's part of that report. Now, with the vision of what NANP wants to be, uh, what we're trying to do is to move this needle and the poultry report that's uh, going to be coming out is going to be the first that uses a hybrid approach. And we are hopeful that moving forward with other NASM committees as well, we can convince them that this consolidated database is one that we simply need to add to and we don't necessarily have to have any information printed that this website can serve as a, a single consolidated database. So we will have some common feedstuffs in the poultry report per se. Those will be static. Um, but the encouragement there is for you to come and use the NANP database to get access to this dynamic nature of the data curation. And so that's what I'm going to go through next. Now, 
through NANP, we are academics again, and we have published on the ability or the way that we go about being able to curate these large data sets. But we know if you've ever received data from a commercial laboratory, there's misidentified ingredients, right? It says it was whole ground corn where clearly it was ground soybean meal. There are things that get mislabeled all the time. The units of measure may not be correct. We have variability in the analytical technique, right? And we know the gold standard would be wet chemistry, but even then, even if we're not applying AOAC, we can have differences between laboratories. So what this requires is an objective data screening method. And by that, I mean an automated method by which we can still have a human looking at the information, but we can identify those outliers to get accurate means and more importantly, accurate standard deviations so we can understand the precision of the data that's in that database. Because in the end, the value of that database is only as good as how clean those data are and how accurate they're going to be. So I put the reference up here, uh, and I see my font is not working well, but this is the process of collecting a large amount of data, pre-screening that, uh, doing a univariate analysis to identify outliers, performing a, a principal components analysis, in the case of dairy, also doing a clustering analysis to ultimately produce that final data set. But it's a multi-step process, which is objective and described, such that we can then understand um, how clean that database is going to be. Now, NANP through the USDA is not part of NASM, the National Academies, but we have a strong partnership with them. So again, we have representatives from both groups um, who are currently on the, the poultry committee. And these are the four pieces that we're trying to do. We are trying to reduce the time that's necessary to bring information together without each individual committee having that burden of generating new composition tables, which in the end are going to be static anyway. We want to implement an objective uh, evaluation method for individual records because it's impossible for humans to keep up on as much literature that's out there, much less all the data that's being produced in a commercial laboratory, and have frequent updates to that database. We want to integrate the feed composition side of what we do with NANP with the modeling, and we've seen examples of that by other speakers as well, um, to support these committee efforts in terms of improving on those models and the value of what's coming out uh, in these expert reports. And finally, when it gets overused and using big data, but we want to simply bring everything together in one place to provide more value uh, for what this is and ultimately have a dynamic generation of nutrient composition data uh, per user specifications. So again, let's get to that concept of what do we mean by dynamic. So this is the front page I chose uh, in the library uh, where we have uh, roosters right on the front. So we're at a poultry science meeting. This is what it looks like when you first come there, and you can access the database in one of two ways. You can go directly to feed composition on the left navigation, um, or on the top of any page, there is a link both to the feed composition database and the modeling database. So this information is, is readily accessible. And again, you can go to animalnutrition.org uh, to be able to get uh, to this place. Once there, and, and you do need to register, it's a free registration, but part of being a uh, as part of a USDA funded program, we have to show our impact. So we're trying to understand how many users and how are they using that database. So once you do register, you'll be, able to, you'll be taken to this page for selecting a feedstock. As part of this, we break it down into individual categories if you're a visual uh, navigator, or you can actually search directly on the top. So typing in soybean meal will bring up every, uh, every ingredient in the database that contains soybean meal or soybean in some way or you can click on the individual category and bring up all the ingredients within that category. So in this case, I'm gonna use the example of soybean meal. So all oil seeds and plant protein are brought up in this way. Selecting your ingredient is the first way uh, to find that information. Once you've selected that ingredient, then it's time to set the user specifications. And there's really two parts of the web page. On the top, uh, here where we're talking about user specifications, this is where you get to set the parameters for the type of data that are going to be returned in those tables. So again, we're gonna use soybean meal as the example. Uh, here on the left, we have the descriptive information. So this is saying something about what is the name, how else may this, uh, this uh, ingredient be named. So we have AFCO numbers, IFN and EU uh, organizational numbers. We have the NANP definition for what do we mean by this. And then in the mid middle column, we have kind of the navigation and the ability to set these specifications. So I'm gonna go through some direct examples of these but here you can look at uh, what are the units? Are we on a dry matter basis or an as-fed basis? Now we default to a dry matter basis to kind of incentivize that, to think about it on, uh, in the absence of any moisture, but what are the years, uh, the year range that you wanna be able to look at a particular ingredient? 
So by default, it's going to show all of the records that were returned, but we can start to specify exactly uh, the subset of information that we want to look at. Data type, was it derived from the peer-reviewed literature? Did it come from a commercial laboratory or an academic laboratory is that third category? Because again, we want to get to the point where we are having users submit new compositional data to the NANP database that we can then uh, continue to make this, uh, grow this uh, resource. And then finally, analysis type. By default, uh, wet chemistry is selected, but we have NIR as well. So you could have both. You could have just one if you wanted to, to bring this down. And then on the very right, we have this ability to apply Boolean logic. This concept of saying for any individual nutrient that is in the database, you want to know ingredients that have something to do with that. So saying above a certain level, below a certain level, or equal to this, in each of these cases, by applying these filters then and clicking the filter composition, it's going to change the number of records that are being returned. So very dynamic in that way, based on what your specific user uh, inputs are going to be. And yes, we do still have the ability to allow you to print those tables such that they can be used offline based on the, the set of information, the filters that you've applied to that, generating your own set of information. But again, applying a different filter will return different results. So the summary tables that are on the bottom of uh, this web page then are going to be those summary tables. And this is what they look like. So here we have, as you would expect, we had the individual nutrient categories along the top. So each of these is a different tab. We go from main constituents on the left through carbs, protein, lipids, minerals, vitamins, and then we also have a place for references as well. So any records that were derived from the peer-reviewed literature, all of those citations will be found in that references tab. On the left, we've got the individual nutrients, and while it's not uh, working just yet, you'll be able to click on those and understand what is the definition of that nutrient and what is the actual analysis that was performed. So again, part of this is an educational piece. We want to be able to use this in the curriculum in, in teaching new graduate students um, what do we mean by these different pieces, using this even in K through 12 education. And then of course, all the summarized data are here on the right-hand side. And as we've seen with other speakers, we want to know how many records are being displayed for each of the individual nutrients, what's the mean, the standard deviation, we also have a coefficient of variation, and the 10th and 90th percentile. So something about the accuracy and precision of the data that's being returned. Now, of course, this goes through each of the different pieces, so I'm just letting this kind of go through. Again, using soybean meal solvent ex extracted as one example of an ingredient here. What it also highlights is how much information we are missing at present. And so you would have seen as it goes through, especially the vitamins, we have a lot of missing information on the vitamins in many of these feedstuffs. The same for some, uh, some of the individual carbohydrates that are present and pr predominantly protein-containing ingredients like soybean meal. So it also helps to identify exactly where the holes or the gaps in knowledge are going to exist. Now, the other part I wanna go through here is really talking about some use cases and going through exactly what we mean by dynamic. So here's conversion from a dry matter to an as-fed basis. One of the hardest things in teaching, teaching undergrads nowadays is this concept of converting from a, an as-fed to a dry matter basis and back and forth. We make that easy here because you can actually just toggle it on and off. So here on the top, using again soybean meal, uh, this is defaulting to a dry matter basis. You can simply select as-fed. When that's done, it will populate that field with the average uh, moisture or the average dry matter content for that particular uh, ingredient. Or you can set your own dry matter if you want to set this at exactly 88%. But basically, from top to bottom, what you see is that it has the same number of records, but now we have changed that mean to go from a, an as-fed basis, uh, excuse me, a dry matter basis onto an as-fed basis. So in this case, uh, crude protein has dropped from 50.92 uh, on a dry matter basis down to 45.74 on an as-fed basis. Number of records did not change, though. We could also select ingredients from a particular time frame, here from 27, 2017 to present. So again, noting here that we are simply going uh, of these records um, to the year 2022. What we're talking about now is the number of results have reduced significantly if we're only looking at the last five years. However, in this case, while the number of records went down, the mean didn't change very much. So that's showing with this particular commodity uh, how consistent it's, it, it fairly consistent it is over time. Um, and both, on, both of these now are on an as-fed basis, things didn't change much. Um, but there were some differences in the standard deviation and, and coefficient of variation as well. 
finally, it's the ability to say, only show individual records that meet these criteria. So you as the user then can say, in this case, only show me soybean meal, solvent extracted, where methionine is above the average and lysine is below the average. So in a particular use case here, uh, applying these Boolean, we only had 25 results that came back, right? So this would be high methionine and low lysine. Only 25 soybean meal samples uh, actually met that criteria, down to 25, and notice our mean has not changed very much in terms of the dry matter or the crude protein, but our CV has gone up, uh, has actually come down in this particular case. So being able to apply, again, the rules that matter to you and, and generate these tables dynamically is, is the important part of what NANP can provide. Now, just to round this out and some of the things that we are starting to do to integrate this further, because having these tables is one piece of the information. Um, we also want to bring some visualization tools to this as well. So understanding in general, uh, what is that bell curve? We've already identified and removed all the outlying records as part of this, but providing some visualization tools that will then go along with um, the, the modeling resources that NANP provides as well. Right now, we only have the compositional information, but we are, we're putting in place an agreement with the National Academies to be able to bring also that uh, animal-derived values that are coming from the individual reports, because obviously we need both the total composition and those inefficiencies uh, for example, looking at standardized illegible uh, coefficients, bring those directly into what we're seeing here. We do have the ability and have integrated into third-party apps. So because this is a database and online, um, my dairy dashboard is, was the original one, but there is a, a basically a, a, an app for your iPhone if you're a dairy farmer, that when you bring it up, they are drawing upon the information that's in the NANP database. So that's what that REST API is. It's the ability for them to directly pull NANP information in to the app uh, that they're providing to their, those producers. We're also going after the ability to, ex to help with the extraction of information from the literature. It's actually relatively difficult for a computer to identify uh, that you have a composition table and to, to have that as something that we want to look at. So using natural language processing and other methods, being able to have AI-based curation of peer-reviewed literature such that we can start to bring more of that information in. We can't simply rely on individual labs to submit this information. But ultimately, we want to be able to derive information from commercial laboratories and from individual, um, individuals who are generating this in an academic or other setting to be able to have this compositional data be imported and ultimately then be moderated by someone who can apply these same rules to make sure that we are removing all outliers. So just a couple of take home messages then. Um, this concept of we can't possibly manage all of the data in one place uh, without help uh, in a digital format. So that's what these NANP databases are all about, managing all of this information when it comes to nutrient composition of ingredients that we are using requires objective methods, and that's what we're trying to apply in, in all of these. But ultimately, the use of these dynamically generated uh, feed composition tables is meant to assist in that precision formulation process. So applying this to what we've, we've heard from other speakers here as well uh, to improve the precision of what we're doing here. So I think we're gonna wait till the end for questions, um, but I do appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Our next speaker is Keisuke Muramatsu from DSM Brazil, uh, talking about real-time analytical methods for commodity ingredients and real-time implementation into commercial diets. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all very much for being here today. Special thanks also for Professor Rosalina, Professor Corver, Professor Applegate for this in invitation. In today's presentation, we are going to talk about this topic, rapid real-time analytical methods for commodity ingredients and real-time implementation into commercial diets. It's a very practical point of view. Aldair is a colleague of mine that helped me to prepare this material. So just to put into context, uh, I brought some figures regarding Brazilian broiler feed production. This is is the trend that we saw in the last 17 years from 2005 to 2022. 
and we saw uh, a constant increase of uh, average 3% feed production per year. So during the 17 years uh, uh, period, feed production, barley feed production in Brazil increased almost 50%. So uh, this brought some implication, mainly for the size of the feed mills the, the recent feed mills projects that is being developed in Brazil, they increased in size to uh, attend this growing demand. And so uh, they are built in a modular way. Normally, they start with just one production lines, but we can add up more production lines. In this example, I brought uh, a feed mill with two production lines, mixer batch size of around four to six tons and capable to deliver 100 to 140 tons per feed of feed per per hour. So basically, in 60 minutes production, it can produce enough uh, feed to uh, feed around 50, 550,000 to 800,000 chicks during the first uh, during the first week of age. So uh, with this, we can understand what is important to have. Uh, a rapid real-time analytical method applied for this large industry because uh, the production is very high and if we, we see any problems during the process, we are going to affect a lot of flocks. The second point is regarding the wet chemistry methods. We usually apply for uh, assessing the composition of feed ingredients. Uh, we see, based on this time, between the reception of the sample and the release of the result, that maybe those traditional methods doesn't meet anymore the needs of these large feed mills because when the, you have the results in your hand, maybe that specific lot of ingredients is already gone. So it will help you <laughs> to explain the problem you are seeing in the field, but maybe you are not going to have enough time to take an action. Another point that we, we, we may question is that if in a soybean meal-based diet, is there enough variability to uh, introduce a, a rapid real-time uh, analytical methods? And when we see this graph, this graph is uh, I, I took some uh, uh, soybean meal crude protein that uh, is arriving in the feed meal, and we see that we have a quite big variation, ranging from from 45.5 percent crude protein up to 48.5. That is because we normally in Brazil we trade 46% crude protein, but the exportation market uh, asks for 48% protein, crude protein, uh, soybean meal. Sometimes in the feed meal we can receive the both. The same for corn, crude protein. We have a quite good variation. We know that the corn is not the main protein source in a broiler diet, but although the variation is quite uh, significant, going from 7% up to 8.5%. So regarding this, all these three points that we talked about, we, we now understand that uh, having rapid real-time analytical method is very important. And how we can do, it, do that? The first way is to understand the, how we can control the process. We have basically four methods. It's the online method, inline, line, and offline. At line and offline are not really real time, but we are going to begin to talk about them. As you can see in this figure, uh, the difference from at line and offline regarding online in line is because we have no more uh, physical connection between the sample and the main product stream. The, the sample is taken away from the main stream and it's analyzed uh, at line if the analyzer is close to the sample collection point or if you need to take the sample to an external area of the feed mill, you call it offline, like in a lab. So some example of that. Here we can see um, a collection of corn sample to mycotoxin analysis. Bef it's at line or offline because we take out the sample from the main load of the corn and we call it almost real time uh, because there is no more physical connection between the sample and the, uh, and the main uh, ingredient load. The results are quite fast. You can obtain in five minutes with a quite good quantitation range and limit of detection. And those data you, you will find, you can use it to decision making. You can refuse the load. You can refuse a specific silo from the supplier. 
you can decide to receive and segregate. For example, if you have a zero non-contamination, you can direct that uh, corn uh, load for less sensitive species like the poultry and, and save the, uh, the swine. You can use, for example, an inactivator or binder, decide which in inactivator or binder you are going to add and in which proportion, depending on the contamination. Now let's go to the real-time uh, process control methods. It's basically online, inline methods. Uh, inline, uh, the analyzer or the sensor is located just in the product stream. Online is quite the same, but a proportion of the uh, product stream is diverted by a bypass and the analyzer is located in this uh, bypass. So in this figure, you can see um, a NIR linked in a uh, linked in an inline process control method. So the ingredient is flowing in this this way, and there is a NIR probe or sensor taking constant measurement of the, uh, of that ingredient. It's real time fast analytical because uh, NIR can take several uh, reading in in a minute, and it takes just some seconds, and it can predict the the most of the most important. Uh, parameters in the in the ingredient. So, just taking a look in a feed mill diagram, we see uh, the NIR sensor located in the raw material dosing silos. It's collecting data constantly and automatically from the from the main ingredients that are being dosed to the mixers. This uh, data is going to feed a formulation software, and it's going to, to update. If you need to make any changes in the matrix, it's going to be done automatically. It's going to be reformulated, and the new version of the formula is going to be sent to the feed mill operation system, and then the new version is going to be produced. Uh, the main advantage of uh, inline online methods, real-time inline online methods, is because it reduces the variation, makes the process more precise and accuracy. They both have a variation regarding standard error of the, uh, the prediction because it's due to the equipment or the analytical method. But what it mitigates is the sampling error uh, allied to manual sampling or lower frequency. In this graph, we can see it more uh, clearly. I, I put in the graph the points what that are being re read by uh, real-time NIR, inline NIR. So this is a graph of soybean meal crude protein entering the process. So here we can see the variab variability in the product, but also the trend. So in some moment, the soybean meal that is entering the process left the, uh, an average of 46.5% and get up to almost 48%. And then it came back. If you have just a net line or offline method or manual sampling, maybe you will take sample here and another second moment of sampling may be the here. So you may suppose uh, wrongly that the process was quite constant, but there was a difference. There was a change in the average. And the software that are linked to this type of uh, methods, they do a statistical, very simple statistics showing that there was really a change in the average of crude protein. So the p-value is very significant. So by that, it starts the reformulation process. Here, I summarize in this table the data collected during 10 days by uh, in inline NIR uh, regarding corn and soybean meal samples. So we have more than 1,000 data points for soybean meal and more than 2,000 data points for corn. I divided the sample population in three parts, 33% lower, middle, upper, uh, regarding each one of these parameters, the same for soybean meal and the same for uh, corn. The worst scenario is when we match uh, in the same batch the, the extremes. So sometimes we will have a low nutrient density soybean meal matching the low nutrient density corn. And the probability by this table, we can admit or suppose that is 11%. 11% of your batch will be really low in some of this parameter, and 11% of your batch will be above the requirement. I know that we cannot talk about requirement based on Professor Gauss' discussion, but it's the way I, I put it, the, uh, 
to understand what is going to happen. So, what is going to be formulated or taken to action by uh, a formulation program? So, if you are formulating with the average uh, thinking on energy and taking into account that s population that I separate by 32% in each of the three groups, when you, you are formulating as an average, you will find a diet meeting 3,160 kcal of metabolizable energy for poultry. In the case, in the 11% of the batches, when you match the low uh, uh, energy corn and low energy soybean meal, you will, you will end up with 3,128 kcal, so 30 kcal less, right? What the soft, uh, formulation software and the feed mill automation system are going to do, they may correct the current batch based on that information, and, they, and, and it may add up uh, fat because it's one of the less ingredient is going to be added in the batch, so it increased the amount of fat and it correct the energy. The, the point is that you may dilute all the component of the diet in 0.6% because you are not correcting the rest. So the best way to correct or to do the adjustment is in the subsequent batch when you correct, you reformulate all the ingredient and you will achieve the, the energy that it is supposed to be. Just another example uh, regarding crude protein and lysine. So formulating with the average value, you should be achieving 19.8% crude protein, 1.11% digestible lysine. If you have that unhappy matching of the low corn and low soybean meal uh, in the same batch, you will, you will end up with 19.3% crude protein and also your lysine level will decrease. So, uh, again, uh, the system can try to adjust this current batch just by adding some synthetic amino acid. You are looking here, the correction that was made to achieve 1.11% digestible lysine. But it's, uh, we can say, an uh, incomplete solution because it's going to just to adjust the available synthetic amino acid that you, you have in the, in the feed meal. Uh, the other essential amino acids or even the non-essential amino acids is not going to be adjusted. So the best way is to reformulate here so you, you, uh, you will achieve the crude protein close to what you, you expected and also correct all the amino acids, right? And a way, because all this investment in feed meal, uh, in software and feed meal operation system costs money. So one, of one way to calculate the uh, return over investment is by the model of diminishing returns. As we saw in the previous presentation, there is a response, for example, for feed conversion, for increasing level of lysine, for example, just a point that you may not see a significant difference where we, we may, you may achieve a maximum point or you will be close to the maximum point, response point. The cost of your feed per ton will increase because increasing the lysine or the, the, the all the amino acid relation, you are going to increase the diet cost, but uh, the bird cost will be a combination of these two columns between the feed conversion and the feed cost. So it will be somewhere in the, not in the middle in this case, but intermediate between the two points. Here is the case you, you have um, a combination of low uh, density ingredient and the bird is going to underperform and its cost, it will be higher. And this is the case that you are overfeeding. You, you could have done a reformulation to save cost to deliver, to, to achieve just the point that with, with maximum return, right? Here, another point, corn moisture content is another important parameter uh, because moisture can dilute your diet density, but also bring some issues about mode development. And if you have a real-time NIR inline system, you can measure the ingredient moisture content here. You have, if you have additional uh, sensor in the mixer, in the conditioner end and the cooler end, this also could make a feedback to meal operation system to control 
moisture addition. Sometimes we are adding moisture in the mix or moisture in the conditioner. Or you can also adjust cooler parameter, increase the feed residence time in the cooler or even the airflow in the cooler to take out this moisture. So here, just an example of what this control, this feedback is going to, uh, to work on the moisture content of your feed. In this side, without control, and in the, in the other side, controlling the parameter based in this uh, real-time uh, process control methods. So it's, it gets much better. Another point is this uh, example. Sometimes uh, if you are not able to add enough moisture to your feed mass pr previous to pelleting, uh, some feed mills, they add moisture like hot water at conditioner and it can enhance pellet quality, even in expanded feed or even in pelleted feed. So it's sometimes an action that is used to enhance pellet quality. But when you in, uh, uh, include water, more and more water and the conditioner, you will have more moisture, of course. And the problem is that uh, blue bar of the moisture content of the feed in at the end of the cooler. And by adding 2.1% hot water at the conditioner, the moisture content is close to 13%. And this, at least in Brazil, we understand that it will increase water activity and uh, there's a, a, a big risk to have more development. So if you have uh, inline real-time uh, process control, all the, the some parameters like cooler uh, parameters could be adjusted to remove this water content. Another technology that are not really applied yet in the feed uh, in the feed mill, but we have seen in some food industry and some pharmaceutical industry is this special filtering technique. Uh, I'm not a physician engineer, but I will try to, to explain in a simple way. Uh, there is a, a laser beam uh, that uh, targets the particle. It could be a, a ground corn or, or a ground soybean meal. And the shadow image is captured by a, a fiber optic array. So using uh, image analyzing software, it can calculate the speed and the size of the particle. So nowadays we do particle size analysis using different sieve, sieves, multiple sieves, can take some times to, to have the results. You do one, sump one sample each time, and using this technology, I think that you can use it uh, as a real, rapid real-time analyzer. So this is the photo of the sensor. The sensor could be located in the ingredient stream, for example, in the exit of the hammer mill, and so it's going to, to monitor the particle size. Uh, I checked the specification of the sensor. It can measure a uh, product particle size ranging from five, 15 microns to six millimeters. So it fits in our feed mill condition, grain size speed up to 50 meters. So it's okay. And it can stand temperature up to 100 degrees Celsius. So it's, uh, it, it attends the normal feed mill conditions. And the potential application that I see for this technology is, for example, for hammer mill adjustment according to ingredient characteristic. Uh, as I have seen some posters that, uh, depending on the variety of the corn that you are grinding, even though you don't change the grinding parameter, you can end up with different particle size because of the physical characteristic of the grain. So uh, in all the cases that we are receiving corn from different parts, sometimes you will be appending the expected uh, particle size and sometimes not. And you, if you have analyzer that are go giving a feedback to your feed me operation system that controls your uh, grinder, you can adjust the hammer tip speed to achieve the expected uh, particle size. So. Uh, I still have uh, not seen that in a feed mill, but it seems that in the future it can be applied. Some final comments. Larger feed mills demanding closer process monitoring because in some minutes they can affect a large number of birds. Some technology that are not new, 
but its application is new, eh, like we saw about the S SFT. Higher feed cost is something that is bad, but it's creating some opportunities to, to invest in some technologies that were too expensive, and now it's more the return over investment is, is more adequate. And the, the important point is do not forget the basic step in the process too. Uh, this is the final breath that, that uh, uh, how can I say, I can try to explain by that. This is the dosing accuracy of soybean meal in a feed meal. And this is the difference in percentage between what it was really dosed and what was formulated. So sometimes we are investing in real time uh, in line online uh, technology, but there is some simple things like the scale that maybe not working so, so well. And maybe it's more important than all the other things that we talked just now. And this is the photo. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the English. This is the photo of the broiler technical team. I work together in South Platon. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chief Susan. Our final presentation is from Charles Stark from Kansas State University. And he'll be talking about how feed will, uh, talking about feed milk challenges, what was formulated is not what the bird eats. So, Charles. Thank you, Doug, and <clears throat> thanks to the committee for inviting me here. Um, some people say, well, I really like the title of your presentation, and I don't know that I actually chose this title. Someone said this was a good title. Uh, this has never really happened to me, so it must be happening out there in the industry that sometimes what you formulate doesn't actually show up in front of the birds. Um, so maybe we'll talk about some of those reasons why. So as we go through the process here, this is my presentation overview, and I set up the presentation for uh, a couple reasons. One is if you are a production nutritionist, or more impor importantly, if you are a graduate student or a researcher and you're wondering what happened in the feed manufacturing process, what may have changed? And so we're gonna look at some of these things, talking a little bit about least cost um, formulation matrix values, and we've already had a lot of talk on that. And so I'm just gonna hit a couple key points we're gonna talk about particle size reduction, then we're gonna talk about pelleting and cooling, and then finally, what's the effect of heat on nutrients, and mainly on enzymes. So first of all, sampling analysis. So when we start the process, we've talked a lot about analysis, we haven't talked about sampling. Where are you gonna find your sample? Where are you gonna pull your sample? Who's gonna pull that sample? Just as a uh, reference, usually it's pulled by the receiving operator in the feed mill. Normally, the lowest paid person in the feed mill is going to pull your sample, and that's going to represent what you're going to feed to your birds. Maybe some disconnect there. Um, also, are you splitting samples? Do you have a sample splitter, or you just take it, put it in a bag, and then cut it into uh, different sections and send it off to lab, or maybe you just send it off to lab that way? So we really need to think about how many times we're sampling, what we're doing with that sample, um, and how we're gonna use that sample. And so here's just an example. We had a grad student that was working um, with some swine diets, and they took an individual analysis on individual samples, and then they took and they composited the samples. And what I wanna point out to you is look at the variation on the individual side versus the composite side. So are you gonna pull an individual sample and then average those numbers, or are you gonna try and create a composite sample? So once again, we need to think about that from a sampling perspective. And then we talked a little bit about uh, nutrient composition. So I like to show this in my classes, and so if you look at it, the top line there is the NR, uh, I'm sorry, NRC values for corn, for the major uh, nutrients there that you may be concerned about. On the bottom, I adjusted that to 15.5% moisture. 
And so you may ask, well, what's magical about 15.5? That's typically what we buy and sell corn at in the United States. Some places it's 15, other places it's 15.5. So if you're thinking you're getting corn at 11 or 12 percent moisture, chances are that's not happening. Ryan, I actually looked up while you're talking. Your database says 88.1 percent average on corn. So 11.9 percent moisture. So once again, where are you getting the corn and are you making those appropriate adjustments? And to further complicate this, if I go through the hammer mill, I'm probably going to take off maybe another quarter or half percent moisture. So we're once again lowering the moisture content, what's going to be put in front of those uh, birds. Looking at DDGs, just an example of four different products and four different nutrient compositions. And it's not um, strange to find two or three different suppliers coming into the same feed mill. Even within a research feed mill, depending on how we're buying it, you may have different um, DDGs in the feed mill and they may be commingled in a bin. So bins of ingredients do not uh, mass flow. We kind of cone in on top of each other. And so moving on to the last part here on least cost formulation. You spend a lot of time doing least cost formulation, getting all the numbers right. You send the formula to the feed mill. Oh, and by the way, I can't actually manufacture the feed the way you asked because my scales don't work in that way. So if you look at the last line there, lysine, according to the nutritionist, and I believe that's really what you wanted, 0.21% and a three ton, you want me to add 6.3 kilos. Well, unfortunately, my scale weighs at either six kilos or seven kilos. Which one do you want? You want six or you want seven? I can guarantee you I will never hit 6.3 as much as you want. And then the scary thing is when you go to feed mills and ask, well, what do you do when this comes up? Oh, we either round up or re round down when we put it into the um, batching computer. So you're having some operator make decisions on based on how you're going to manufacture the feed. Because most of the times I find that nutritionists don't understand what the scale resolution is at the feed mill. The number one issue I typically find when I start asking the question is what is the scale resolution? Okay, so we're gonna switch gears and move over into particle size. We've, we've talked a little bit about that. What's important to understand is the two factors that affect particle size are going to be screen size, the diameter of those holes, and the tip speed. And then we have all these other factors that come into play, uh, such as the air assist system, hammer setting, hammer pattern. But those are probably not as big an issue as the screen size and tip speed. And so as the last speaker mentioned, tip speed is going to affect the actual particle size. So if you look at this screen, we have three different tip speeds, around 17,000 feet per minute, 21,000 feet per minute, or 25,000 feet per minute. And depending on the tip speed I have in that hammer mill, I'm gonna get different particle sizes coming out of that hammer mill. And so if you don't know what the tip speed is, or you have a target particle size, and the tip speed is going to be different than you expected, you may get different particle sizes. And lay on top of this, when we get a moisture change in the corn, the drier the corn, the more powder we create in a hammer mill, and so we're going to have even a lower particle size. And so all these come into play. So what's important is how you do the particle size analysis. And so I've spent a good chunk of my career trying to convince the industry how to do particle size analysis correctly. And so we have published a, um, a bulletin, it's on the website at K-State, and you can look at it, but it talks about how to do particle size analysis. And what's important, if you're doing particle size analysis, is that two things are occurring. First one is that you're using this dispersing agent, and second one is that you're using sieve agitators. If you're not using those, I can almost guarantee you're getting a higher particle size value than you expect, which in the swine industry is costing us money in feed conversion, 
in the boiler industry, if you're not getting good gizzard development, that could cause a problem. And so you may think I'm grinding at 800 microns when the reality is you're somewhere around 600 microns. And so understanding what's that doing in the performance of the bird. And so as we look at this, particle size analysis, the benefits are, if I'm a feed mill, I want smaller particle sizes because that helps me make a better quality pellet. But that doesn't mean the bird is going to perform as well. So the bird is going to want the larger particle size for gizzard development and for um, longer retention time. And so it has something to do with this uh, phenomenon or this process called reverse peristaltus in broiler GIT. And so before I went to NC State and worked with Dr. Brake, I didn't even know what any of this was. But he told me I need larger particles to stimulate the gizzard and to give better digestion. And so we spent a lot of time looking at this about how we improve the digestion of the broiler. And so this is just looking at body weight. And if you look at body weight with 0% coarse corn versus 50% coarse corn, once you get um, through the process, you're seeing there's differences in body weight. There's also differences in feed conversion. And so what I want you to also look at is on the bottom uh, part of that slide, it says this study was run in a pen study and it was run with pellets and fines. And so the amount of pellets and fines, once again, is going to have an effect on the performance of that bird. And so I'm going to just flip back. This was uh, body weight and feed conversion with pellets and fines mixed together. And then we switched and removed all the uh, fines that we could, and so we just fed pellets, which normally doesn't occur in most poultry operations. If you can find a pellet, sometimes it's considered a good day in the industry. But once again, if you are doing research, if you're a graduate student and you're doing research and you get a varying amount of fines, what is that doing to the performance of their bird? And so as we look at this, when it comes to body weight, there really wasn't much difference in this particular slide or this particular data set, but there was a difference in feed conversion when we had screen pellets. And so if you look back at the previous ones, it wasn't a bit as big of an effect with coarse corn and screen pellets as it is uh, when you have fines in there. And so my point is, you need to think about this, the particle size of your corn and whether you're feeding pellets that have been screened or fined. All these factors come into play. And we're not even done yet about how I can change what you formulated to what I'm actually feeding to the bird. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the pelleting process. Okay, so if we think about why we're feeding pellets, why are we spending all this money to feed the pelleted feed? It has a lot to do with we can decrease wastage, and that's assuming that I'm not sending a lot of fines to the, to the bird. Um, it will decrease ingredient segregation, and so that's a benefit. It will destroy pathogens, but that's only to the point that I don't have recontamination after the pelleting process. So as soon as that feed leaves the pellet die, I have the potential to recontaminate that feed. Not as much as what I started with, but that's always a factor. And then the last one I think is probably the biggest reason for me that we pellet is because I can stick everything in a similar package. And so from a least cost formulation perspective, it gives me more opportunity to try and put in different ingredients from week to week or day to day, as was just discussed. So what factors affect the pelleting process? So here's two different data sets. Um, the first data set is Dr. Fahrenholt, and he broke this down into different factors. He looked at dye specification. He looked at grind size. He looked at formulation, throughput, and conditioning time. And then he kind of broke that down and said, well, this is the percent impact that has on pellet quality. 
Dr. Binky, back in the early 90s, had the graph, and you can see it's different. Nine, or about 20% conditioning, um, about 20% grinding, about 15% dye. The thing I like, formulation, I can blame both of my pellet quality issues on the nutritionist. That's one nice thing. But the reality is, as a feed mill manager, I don't have a lot of control over formulation. So I have to work with what I have been given. And so understanding these factors going into the situation or going into the process helps you understand what's that going to look like when we feed the birds. And so here's some work I did a long, long time ago when I was a graduate student, as you can see by uh, the date there. I took and I manufactured pellets using four different fat types. And four different fat types gave me four different pellet quality numbers. Then I overlaid that with how much fat goes into the mixer. Um, looking anywhere from 0% control to 1.5 to 3 to 6% fat. And so if you're manufacturing diets and you're adding over 1.5% added fat to the diet, you're probably not going to make a good quality pellet. And so then you're going to get back to what is the effect of pellet quality on bird performance. Okay? And so if you're a nutritionist and you're sending a diet to a feed mill and say, I want to add 2% added fat, we do have something called post-pellet liquid application systems, but they'll never apply 1% added fat downstream and 1% in the mixer. I was at a feed mill a couple weeks ago. The nutritionist sent over a formula, 2.1% added fat. What did they do? They stuck it all in the mixer, and they were wondering why they only got 60% pellets going out to the farm. Well, no one actually talked about the effect of how much is in the mixer as compared to how much is post-pellet. So if we're going to talk about pellet quality, the next question, and I see this so many times when I review papers on pelleting, is how is pellet quality actually determined? There are lots of ways to determine pellet quality. And depending on how you determine it, you will have a wide variety of answers. The industry is probably as a whole is moving to a Holman tester just because it's quicker. But the question is, um, are you screening the pellets going into and out of the Holman? Some people screen uh, into, but they don't screen coming out of the Holman. That will give you different results. Are you running for 30, 60, uh, 90, or 120 seconds? That will give you different results. Across the top of there, there should be a filter paper. That filter paper will also affect the results. The type of filter paper you use will also affect your results. The pressure will affect your results. If you run five samples in a row, the sixth sample may be different because the temperature of the air is changing. And so we had an undergraduate just do a whole research project on how many things can be different in the test that will give you different results. And so when you're getting the results back and looking at them, do you really know where they came from? And so we've talked about the, uh, the effect of moisture. The last speaker talked about the effect of moisture on the performance of birds. And so in this example here, I looked at what would happen if I formulated a diet to 13% moisture, leaving the cooler. Sometimes I'm doing a very good job in my cooler, and I remove 1% um, moisture, so I'm down to 12%. Or sometimes it's just not a very good day in the feed mill, and I leave an extra 1% in there. What does that do to the energy content of the birds being fed? And so if that's what's actually occurring, how is that affecting your performance in the field? And more importantly, how would it be affecting a research project if we have different energy values in the feed that I'm delivering to your birds. And so Leland McKinney, he did a very interesting uh, project where he looked at the effect of performance and behavior in birds. And so he actually watched birds, how much time they were actually eating and resting. And so 
I find the, uh, the second slide um, on the right hand side probably the most interesting is when you feed them good quality pellets, they spend less time at the feeder. They eat, they sit down, they grow, and there's better performance. When you feed them poor quality pellets, they spend more time at the feeder, more time up going to the feeder, and so the energy that they're getting in this example here, um, he said 10% improvement is equal to 14 kcal. Okay? So if you look at the effect of percent pellets over the, um, the course of the lifetime of a bird, you can see that it changes. And so in this example here, we fed 100% pellets or screen pellets versus 50%. And so you can see there was a, a difference in body weight. And so your body weight is going to be different. And this is the case with males and females. And just as has been discussed um, earlier, males and females will respond differently. So the effect on males and females will be different in your research based on how many pellets you actually feed them. But what was interesting for me is even though there was a difference in body weight the in, uh, for the entire lifespan there, we didn't really see an effect in feed conversion until we got out past 35 days. So up until 35 days in this study, there really wasn't much of an effect on feed conversion. So depending, are you looking at body weight or are you looking at feed conversion when it comes to these animals? Also, um, Wilmer Pacheco did some work at um, NC State before he went to Auburn, and he looked at screen pellets versus 50%, and once again, over the 49 days, there was effect on body weight and feed intake, but nothing on feed conversion. So here's a, a new one that's coming out. We're starting to talk about, well, what should we be feeding those uh, day-old chicks? Uh, mash diets, mini pellets, or micro pellets, if you will, and so we ran a study at K-State looking at mash, micro pellets, and then we took crumbles that were what we call a coarse crumble, a fine crumble, with and without fines, and guess what? We get different results. And so depending on whether you're feeding good quality crumbles, the size of that crumble, you may be getting different results. And so why is this important? Well, if you look at the pellets versus the fines, there's differences in the nutrient content. And so uh, John Young looked at the nutrient composition of pellets and fines, and there was a difference in protein content and a difference in fat. And so in this particular study, the fat was applied post-pellet um, application, and so there's more surface area per volume, if you will, on a fine than there is a pellet. So it didn't surprise me we had more fat there. And then uh, Wilmer Pacheco shared this with me, looking at the um, enzyme activity um, on pellets versus fines at the feed mill, the middle pan, and the end pan. And once again, there's a difference in the amount of enzymes that's uh, being applied. So I want to just take the, the last few minutes I have and talk about what does this potentially have to do with nutrients or more specifically enzyme stability? Because there is a lot to understand when we start talking about enzyme stability. Because when a company comes and says, I want to test my product at 180 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 80 degrees C, that's not actually what comes out of the pellet mill because we have um, friction that occurs in that dye. And so trying to understand that is important. So if you're doing anything with stability work or working with enzymes, you may want to get a hot uh, mash condition sample so you know what the temperature of the mash is. And that's typically the mash temperature that we pelled at. So you hear people talk about, I'm pelleting at 180 or 185 degrees. But what's also important is what's the temperature coming out of that pellet dye. And so if that temperature has a 5 or 10 degree temperature rise, you may be affecting the stability of the actual enzyme. And in most commercial operations, we cannot measure this. 
in research applications, we can measure this. So it's important to understand that and report that. And so here's some work that um, was done with by Lore, looking at methionine, isoleucine, proline, and uh, once again, understanding what this temperature pelting at 74, 85, and 96 degrees have to do with um, the actual nutrient digestibility or the actual stability of enzymes. And it's interesting how many feed mills I go to, I go to the pellet mill operator and I say, well, what temperature are you pelting at? As hot as I can pellet. So that could be 185, it could be 190 degrees. It says, have you talked to your nutritionist about how high you can pellet? Well, no, should I? We call up nutritionists and say, well, yeah, you shouldn't be over like 185 F or over 85 C. Huh, that's interesting, didn't know that. And so once again, you wonder, are you getting all the enzymes out in the, in the field? Um, JT Pope at NC State did some work with xylanase, putting fat in the mixer. And what he found was as I add more fat in the mixer, I had better recovery of xylanase. Why is that? Because as we go through that pellet dye, we create a lot of friction and we tend to destroy enzymes. In addition to that, when we look at phytase stability, on this particular slide here, I put in um, what we ran for conditioning temperature and the hot pellet temperature, what came out of the pellet dye. And so you can see in that first one, we went from 170 degrees to 192 F. So we picked up almost 22 degrees F, running at 50% of the rated capacity of the pellet mill. When we actually ran that pellet mill at closer to 100% capacity, the stability increased because we're spending less time in that pellet dye. And sometimes when we go into a research environment, we don't think about the fact that we're running a pellet mill slower than rated capacity and we spend time in that dye. And while it's in that dye, all we're doing is cooking that uh, feed, whether that's the, the nutrients or the enzymes. And so we looked at this, one of my graduate students looked at the dye retention time. He actually calculated the retention time of the feeds in the dye based on the thickness or compression ratio of that. And then overlaid that with phytase stability. And you can see in this particular case, when he got a higher LD ratio up around 10 and about 2.6 seconds in that pellet dye, it really started hammering away the phytase. And so one thing that um, a graduate student, um, uh, Courtney Trulock did, is she worked with understanding what's the condition, mash, temperature, and the pellets and with a number of her PhD uh, projects, she started looking at stability. And so what's interesting to note is that whether you're looking at the conditioning uh, mash temperature, if it gets up to 185 or 190 degrees, we start hitting stability. Or if you look at hot pellet temperature at any one of those, it also affects stability. So understanding what's the temperature that pellet coming out of the pellet mill uh, is important. So with that, here's the summary that I want to leave you with. Why you don't get the feed that you actually asked about? There's a not lot of reason, but some of the key points is, are you actually doing a good job of understanding what the ingredients are that you're using in that particular batch of feed? Number two is particle size analysis. How did you do particle size analysis? and understand that methodologies will vary from lab to lab. But at least in broilers, we need to increase the coarse particles in that diet. And so if we don't understand what our particle size is, then we can have a negative effect on performance. Feed form, whether you're feeding it mash or pellets or the percent fine, all these have an effect on performance. And if you're doing a research project, and you feed a mash diet, and I go back and I repeat that same study and do a pelleted diet, I'm gonna have different answers. If I do a mash diet, a pelleted diet, and a pelleted diet with fine, guess what? I'm gonna give you different answers. So this is all important to understand. 
And the, the final point is that condition temperature, hot pellet temperature, dye specification can affect or may affect enzyme stability and nutrient digestibility. So that's a 25 minute synopsis of what could go wrong. And I have 30 years of stories. So if you really want to know the whole picture, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. And so my point is, don't let this scare you, but sit down and talk to the feed mill, talk to the manager, talk to the operators, understand what they're doing in the process because the more you understand about the process, the, um, the better opportunity you will have to actually get what you formulated in front of the bird. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Charles. It was a great talk. Um, can I get the speakers to come up to the front? And we've got a few minutes for questions. We have uh, Todd and Emanuele will be taking microphones around to answer uh, to, for people that want to ask questions. Um, we also have the opportunity to ask uh, Paul Tillman and Bill Dozier some questions. Uh, you'll have to give us your questions and we're communicating via WhatsApp. So um, I'll... Uh, I'll, uh, I'll grab another chair here, so. So are, are, there any qu are there any questions for any of our speakers right off the bat? Oh, here's one. <laughs> uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, this is for the... Uh, Brazilian gentleman from GSM. Yeah, do you have any data that, uh, uh, by the way, I was very glad that you showed that last slide on the variability just in batching systems and, and things like that. But do you have any data that shows that you're really fine tuning the actual heat analysis by doing the inline or online? Uh, quality assurance yeah Th thanks for the question I I maybe I did not mention but all the inline NIR that is being applied uh, to control uh, ingredient or even uh, moisture content of the final feed uh, in Brazil I think that we have less than 10 feed mills doing that some of them they are still validating so they are not achieving a reduction in the variation, but the, those ones that began first the, the, the implementation of this technology are collecting uh, already some gains uh, or saving uh, feed, co uh, feed costs by reformulating. So we had some uh, information about that uh, a specific feed mill that is uh, saving money by reformulation and so we expect that the variation is reducing because he's already formulating in and implementing into commercial diets. The other companies, sometimes they do not open the data, but uh, we have seen that uh, at least in the, the last two to three years that uh, ent is entering more and more feed mills to that uh, uh, investment in, in inline system. I'm not sure if I, <laughs> I clearly responded, but I, my uh, impression is that they are achieving uh, good results, reducing the variation of the process. Ryan, is there um, any plans to, in the future, collect uh, on the same sample on your commercial labs data, is there any plans to have those labs supply repeatability analysis within their lab if they're continuously providing specific raw material to you so that you can get a better handle of that? It, yeah, it's a great question. It's one that we, we would like to be able to, to analyze, right? We understand that there are differences in those. Um, our policy is that we are actually anonymizing data 
um, such that we cannot tie it back to any individual commercial laboratory uh, because we, we don't want any information that belongs to the individuals who sent those samples, for example. So, but that's one of those questions as, as we work with uh, both on the feed composition committee and the modeling committee that we want to answer some of those questions at repeat analysis. Um, in addition to other pieces, the one piece of metadata that we don't have in our data set is the origin of the sample. So understanding geographic location is one that's very difficult to pin down, um, and we never really know where it's coming from. Um, but we know that's another gap in the literature that we'd like to be able to tackle. Is there any way you could move to uh, attaching a zip code or something to that to be able to do it? And is there any way that we can, um, s as industry, supply that connection to you on the same samples as it comes in? So attaching a zip code, again, is only as good as where the sample was taken from. We don't know whether it was where it was grown, for example. And so there, that's a different piece of where uh, the sample came from. Um, it's possible, yes, right? We want to bring as much metadata in for modeling purposes down the road as possible. Um, and so this is why we're trying to form these connections with different laboratories and, and within the industry. Yes, these are questions that we want to be able to answer, especially as we then apply that information with the modeling committee to animal performance. How do we relate composition and variability in composition to that of how the animals responded, much like uh, what we've heard on this panel today? Dr. Starr, uh, two questions. One on uh, pelleting and enzyme stability. We find that the rate of cooling is very important. Not only the throughput through the pellet mill, but how fast you can cool it as a measurement. Do you have comments on that? And, and the second one, you're recommending it sounds like 185, and I'll take 190, 195 any day and reduce my salmonella to zero, and my total plate counts are extremely low. Could you comment on that? So there's not much data on the cooling aspects, but you're right. The, the faster you can get that cooled down, the, the better it's going to be for, uh, for the enzymes, of course. And that's always a challenge, uh, trying to get that back to, I like to within uh, 5 degree or 5 to 10 degrees of ambient Fahrenheit size. And so on stability, um, of enzymes, it really gets back to the source you're using, what they uh, recommend is the, the maximum level. Um, from a feed manufacturing standpoint, uh, usually the, the hotter and the wetter we can condition that feed, the better it is for us, but that may not be what's best for the bird, especially if you uh, get rid of all the enzymes. And we've done that before. I've pelleted feed beautiful pellets, and there's no, no phytase left in it. So there's that balancing act. And so what I tell uh, customers, you always need to be checking your final product for your enzyme stability level. Charles, Charles, to follow up on that, when you tend to pellet at those higher temperatures, 190, 195, yep. you're going to see a decrease in your amino acid digestibility as well as decrease in your enzyme, ac enzyme activity. Can you comment on that? Because I've seen Dr. Boney's uh, presentation on what high pelleting does to those other nutrients. Since I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, but I, I've seen that, that same data that the, the hotter, there could be some negative effects on that. Um, you know, from a feed manufacturing standpoint, once again, what I would recommend is you talk to the people running the equipment so that they understand any negative effects that you may believe uh, could be occurring from pelleting at 190 to 195 because uh, we have turnover in feed mills, and if you don't uh, let them know, the hotter the better. So, did I, did I dance around that question good enough? Thank, uh, thank you, Professor Marcos. When we are talking about of lower requirements of phosphorus uh, to light hand. What do you tell us about his radio to the calcium and what kind of calcium we have to look about in the feed stuff or in the, or in the feed? Yeah, so that is um, well related to what I've shown you here. The, the range of calcium content in the feed was between 3.5 and 4 percent. Um, and uh, 
I, I'm not aware of any study that really looked into interactions um, between calcium supply and phosphorus supply at this level of phosphorus supply. Um, and uh, what the I think the what what commonly is done um, is that um, you have a look at the particle size of the limestone that is used, um, and that approximately half of it is coarse limestone in order to 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 prolong the digestion time of the limestone and uh, better adjust it to the time when it's needed for actual formation. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry, maybe two. Ryan, I'll try to be a little bit more specific on the geographical data set. Um, perhaps, uh, do you feel that most of the data you're collecting for that database is coming from the U.S., corn from the U.S., or soybean from the U.S., or you think it's including soybean meal from Brazil or any other parts of the world? And obviously a hot topic as we have another question on this, but so one of the pieces here is that we, because NANP is a USDA-funded uh, program, technically we're only supposed to be working on things that are within the United States. So all these samples were sourced within the United States, but we don't know where, th where those feedstuffs were grown originally. And that's, I think, the difficulty. And, and there are ongoing efforts to do this. This is a, a, a big issue that we need to be able to tackle. Um, but without having definitive ties of that sample and its origin to the analysis that we have tied with it, it's very challenging to actually ascribe any differences in geographical location to the quality of that, uh, that feedstuff. Okay, thank you. Just for because, uh, well, we want to he listen from the speakers previous to the coffee break also. And uh, this question is for Peter Ferquet uh, or Kirk Krasin. Uh, you have shown some computational, computational technologies. Could you give us some practical applications on that? Because uh, the presentation was quite philosophical. Uh, could you uh, give us some examples of the practical application of that? Well, philosophical by intention, right, Kurt? <laughs> yes. Well, what I intended to do is to, to kind of forecast these are these potential things. And then today you heard subsequent speakers that they gave you little bits of information that allows you to then to envision to use the data that's collected in the NANP We've got models there as well. There'll be, uh, you know, things added to that. When we've got aspects of feed manufacturing and you've got sensor data like NIR to now feed into that, and we've got sensor data in the houses that can now optimize our growth parameters. Um, information that comes from the breeders, I think that's one of the services that we should always tell the breeding companies every time they come out with a number, uh, a new model, give us the growth parameters like the A's, the B's, the coefficients so we can now generate a growth curve and then from there we can then get closer to a requirement. So it's a holistic approach and uh, sometimes just managing all of this massive data is when we need to begin to uh, recruit the, uh, you know, the, the computer scientists and artificial intelligence. We're already using a lot of that in curating and things like that. So taking the data, curating it, classifying it, and, and there's a automated ways to do that to help us get towards our goal. So it's a recreation of, of what we can do with the tools we have uh, to actually you know, bring our, our whole science of, of nutrition and um, determining requirements that's optimized for the conditions that we want to generate faster. Kirk, do you want to add anything? I think you already did it perfect. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna take uh, Chair's privilege and ask Rob Gauss one question. Um, what do you think is standing in the way of companies looking at optimizing based on profitability? As a pr I mean, it seems like an obvious thing to do, but why, why aren't companies leaping to do this or why haven't they done it already? I think you should ask these guys here. <laughs> I've been trying for many years to, to convince people of this, and uh, there are a few companies that are doing it, uh, and very successfully. But why the other companies don't do it, I have no idea. I think um, uh, I think agri-stats is, is one of the limiting factors. I think people terrified, I believe, 
people are terrified of moving away from the point they are on uh, in every stats uh, and don't believe possibly that the sorry there's people over there I can't see them uh, that people uh, that um, by using models they could actually improve their position in agri stats rather than go downwards um, I, but I'd really like to hear from the audience why it is that um, models are not um, taking off as, as I would uh, would have uh, would have hoped <coughs> all right so maybe that's something we'll have a discussion about uh, after the uh, the session ends so um, we, we've run out of time I would like to take the opportunity to thank each of our speakers I think there was a, a great variety of, of talks that fed into a common theme. So please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs> a, a, a symposium like this doesn't just uh, take care of itself and I've, I've already acknowledged the, um, the, the organizing committee but I do want to acknowledge our important sponsors, uh, ADM Alliance Animal Nutrition. <laughs> Uh, CBS Bio Platforms, <laughs> and I should note that their name is uh, their old name on the on the poster outside. So uh, CBS Bio Platforms, Dr. Bogdan Slominski, uh, and PSA has also provided important support financially and uh, logistically. So thank you very much. Um, look forward to next year's meeting. Uh, we haven't started planning yet, although. Yeah, we've got eight minutes. Um, so if you have suggestions, if you have ideas of things that uh, we should consider covering next year, uh, the organization for this meeting starts about in uh, September or October. So um, we don't have a lot of time before uh, we need to start next year. So enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you for your attendance. And uh, have a good evening in the, well, the heat outside after the, the chill today. So thanks very much. <laughs>